Okay, we're here with Anthony Silva in his Christmas-themed dining area here uh, up in North Stockton. It's uh, a few days uh, before Christmas, and um, we're going to just talk as the mayor uh, prepares to leave office after a very eventful four years. Um, and as you leave office, Mr. Mayor, um, what things can you talk about that, that you would say you're proudest of in terms of your time on the job? Well, I think um, I was very effective at getting um, average everyday residents involved with city government, um, really going out there and, and recruiting individuals who no, no, normally never took an interest in city government, getting them involved with everything from the Charter Review Commission to uh, the Animal, uh, Animal Rights Commission, uh, getting involved with the homeless events, um, feeding the homeless, uh, toy drives, you name it. Um, and really giving people a voice. I think that people will remember me as a very transparent person and someone that um, was always willing to give out my cell phone number. People could email me, they could Facebook me, they can call me 24 seven and I would do the best of my ability to really meet the, their needs. Um. What would you say, I mean, do you have like a single best memory of the job or a few memories, things that really stand out that were good days or good events? Well, I think a good day for me was when somebody had a problem and they were up against a brick wall and they really couldn't, uh, you know, they were, they kind of lost hope uh, for whatever reason. And somehow we were able to, you know, work something out. Uh, whether, you know, a good example is, you know, like a family it was right in the beginning of my term, but a family had called me and they didn't have a lot of money and the husband had just died and um, one of the kids lost their dog. And it turns out that our shelter did in fact have their dog, but they didn't have enough money to get the dog out. And um, so I guess for whatever reason, the city was going to uh, um, terminate the dog. Um, for lack of a better term, or they were going to adopt it. And so we did what we could to remedy that situation and, and give the dog back to the, to the family. And that just like the, their eyes lit up when you were able to uh, give them back something that meant so much to them. So it's little things like that that uh, made the job uh, pretty good. And what would you say stood out as your most difficult moment or moments? Well, I guess dealing with the, um, you know, dealing with the local newspaper, the record was the hardest for me in all fairness, um, because, you know, obviously when you're in a position where everybody's watching, um, if you leave the toilet seat up, there's a good chance that somebody might report it. And so there was a lot of uh, circumstances. Um, some were my doing, um, some were just a combination of different factors, but a lot of time I think the local media, they latched on to what they thought could be a sexy story and they just reported it without having all the facts. And if, if I was to go and talk to them now, they would say, yeah, but based on the information I had at the time, this is, we reported the story, and then by the way, we don't make, we don't write the headlines, somebody else in some other city somewhere writes the headlines. Well, I could go back to situation um, after situation and really show how there's holes in that story and it wasn't um, a truthful, effective story. And so I think it was designed to, you know, sort of be sexy and try to grab the attention of the readers and, and, and sort of suck people in. And, um, you know, sometimes it was my fault, uh, but I don't think that really did the residents of Stockton any good by having all this BS in the local newspaper. Because what happens is once that stuff got out there, if it was sexy enough for the TV news, then Channel 10 or 13 because uh, they were the biggest culprits, they would latch onto those stories and they would make a one day story into a two or three day story. And then the editorial board would write something that Sunday. So the story would go on and on and on and then the, the local columnist of the newspaper, I don't have to say his name, but then he would of course chime in with his two cents and I guess he doesn't have an editor so he could write whatever he wants. And so a lot of times his stories were just pretty much nasty. But I guess he has a certain clientele of people in the city that like his style of writing and so um, I mean that's obviously the most stressful stuff for me is 
is, uh, and I didn't have a, a public information officer, which I think is important for every mayor to have. And um, so I guess in the future, the mayors will have it. And unfortunately, I didn't have that opportunity, but uh, that's the point of having that position so other people can deal with the media. What, do you, what difference do you think that would have made if you had that person? Um, sometimes the person could have, you know, they work relationships. When you're in the news industry, a lot of times people, you know, work relationships. Like the PIO at the school district, they have a certain relationship um, with the record, and uh, they're able to uh, deter stories sometimes by saying, "Oh, no, no, you guys are not. You're not. You're not climbing up the right the right tree with this one," and they're able to um, get some more accurate information before somebody goes and just writes the story. Mm -hmm. Is there anything, I mean, if you look back over your term, that if you, if there was something you could take back and if you had things to do over, you would not? Sure, I think about it all the time. I think a lot of people in their everyday lives, uh, especially at the end of a year, think, what can I have done different the last year, um, you know, to make my life better or to make my year uh, go a little bit smoother? And, you know, there's probably, you know, maybe 15 different things that I can think of um, that I would have done different. There's different people at the beginning of my term I would have reached out to. Uh, there's some people I guess I would have kissed their ass a little bit and that's that's the truth. You guys want the truth. There you go. Um, but, you know, you can't dwell on the past. You can only move forward and so that's that. How hard has the aftermath of the election been for you since November 8th? Well, I mean, it's it's difficult, obviously. Um, I've been in a situation before where I lost an election by one vote that I still don't feel I really lost. And, you know, to folks that just go to work nine to five every day and they look at the stuff on TV and the newspaper, they're like politicians. I can't stand them. They're like dirty and shady and because everyone's always writing about them and telling stories about them. But they don't think that, hey, we're normal people too. And then when you run for office and then all of a sudden when you lose now you don't have health insurance for your own family and um, and that happened to me um, you know eight years ago when I was on the Stockton Unified Board and um, so it, it changed life for me a little bit and that was a, that was a tough loss it's around the same time that, that I lost my grandmother so it was a tough time for me and you know this is a tough time uh, for me too I mean I expected it uh, the last few months but um, at the same time you know, does it still hurt a little bit? Yeah. But, you know, when I walk down the street or when I walk through the mall, people still recognize me. They come up, they give me a hug. Half the people still think I'm mayor. They don't pay attention to what goes on in the city. You are still mayor right now. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's just, it is what it is. You know, I think that it's still a low voter turnout. There's 305,000 residents in Stockton. The fact that 57,000 folks voted is concerning. That's less than 20% of a of a population and um, it is what it is you know the people have spoke the people that did vote I've learned that the loudest people in life sometimes they don't vote you know and I this is this is what I can honestly say and I think a lot of people would agree with me during my four years I catered a lot to the poor and to the middle class and to people that were never gonna vote to begin with and I got a lot of criticism from my own friends that says, hey, you know, why don't you pay more attention to Trinity Parkway and Spanos Park and Brookside? Spend less attention to, you know, South Stockton and East Stockton. And, uh, you know, they, their comments have some merit. And, um, but, you know, I gave those other people a voice too. And, you know, that's funny that you mentioned that because I was just about to ask you, you know, what, what do you feel made you be the people's mayor? Uh, you you called yourself the people's mayor more so, I think, in the last year during the campaign. But that really was part of your identity, or a big part of your identity this past, you know, during during your time in office. Um, well, I think the why people. Do, why do you think you were able to reach those individuals who were the base of your support? What do you? How do you think you connected with them? Because I don't try to be somebody I'm not. I'm not trying to get to Washington, D.C. one day. I'm not trying to set history by being the first person in this category to be mayor or the first person in that category to be mayor. Um, I'm an average, everyday person that got frustrated with what was going on in my city, 
so I decided to run for office just like other people out there they're thinking about it and guess what I got elected so I wasn't polished I didn't always say the right things I didn't always dress the right way I didn't always bow down and kneel down to the right people and families that maybe I should have and so I think people saw that they're like wait a minute he's just like me everything doesn't go perfect in his life he didn't go to the the greatest schools but he went to local schools he graduated from Lincoln he graduated from Humphreys College wait a minute he's just like me if he could do these things maybe we can too and so I think it resonated with people it gave them hope because I didn't get up and just tell them a bunch of great stories about uh, doing this or doing that I told them about the the hard times in my life too, losing my mom um, you know dealing with the media in the past um, I've given them real life examples of people that I know around me that have struggled and I told them I struggled too and you know a few years ago Stockton was in that situation where um, we were in that abyss of bankruptcy and and just bad employee morale with our police department our fire department a lot of departments um, people had a lot of negative things to, to say about Stockton we led the nation in foreclosures so I look at that in my life those times where I fell into an abyss and it was hard for me to climb out like when I lost my mom and I didn't have a job there was times where I didn't know how I was gonna climb out but I found a way to climb out and even someone like yourself who's been uh, fairly critical of me my political tenure my eight years that we've been together um, you have to admit there's some times where I've surprised you and you're like hey why is this guy still operating why is he still ticking and I think that's what resonates with people uh, that I give them hope okay I'm gonna interject to you I don't feel I've ever been critical of you but I feel that I've always given I've always presented what but you've told me a lot too. You've called me over the last, and I say eight years, because we spent four years at Stockton Unified pretty much, almost yeah. four, and then four years here. And there's times where you've called me or I've dialogued with you and said, Anthony, I have nothing to do with that headline. I agree with you. It's a stupid headline. It has nothing to do with the story. I didn't write it. You told me that zillions of times. Okay. But that's what, that's what sucks people into those stories. And I'll read the article, and it has nothing to do with what the, the headline is, and the headline is negative in nature. Well, then I wasn't being critical. Of okay, but you know that by writing a certain story, there's a certain message that the author likes to convey in his story. If you were on my payroll, and you worked for me, then every story you wrote about me would pretty much be positive. There would be a positive spin to it. The media has the power to make someone, just like I said the other night, a villain or a hero. When you identified Michael Tubbs years ago at Franklin High School, right? Everyone thought he was arrogant, but they thought, hey, this kid maybe he has a chance if he if he if he learns to practice what he preaches, that he came from the hood and, and never forget where he came from. You were already sort of building him up years ago in your story. I always knew that Michael Tubbs would be someone to contend with because already the newspaper was building him up. And I'm like, well, what did he do? Did he cure cancer yet? I know he has a, a tough story, but so does hundreds and hundreds of people in Stockton and but I understand I, well, I, I, I mean when I first met him he was a 17 year old kid at Franklin High School who had won an award from uh, from an author and I was just assigned to go and okay. interview him and I did and that's you know that's the first right well off the record and off this camera I'll give you examples of stories you guys have written that is shaped uh, you know shaped the path of my political career up till now and I'm going to show you how there's holes in it and how there's there's major discrepancies of facts. Okay, well, we're, right. We are on the camera yeah. right now. Yeah. So. Okay, so we'll do it later. <laughs> um, it's not, you know, I was thinking about this because, you know, I go to work and I know that I'm a reporter at the record and that's a part of my identity. And for you, you know, over the past decade or so, you've been the president of the Boys and Girls Club. You were on the, and president of the Stockton Unified School Board. Um, and you were the mayor of Stockton. And when you wake up on January 1st, you're not gonna be any of those things. Is that something you've thought about? And is that of course I've thought about it. Is that something that's a little daunting, a little bit of course scary it is. for you? Of course it is. How do you, how do you feel with I mean, that? I don't, anybody out there that you know that's you're about to go through Christmas with your kid and all of a sudden you know that hey you're not gonna really have a job uh, come January 1st you know that's 
that's obviously pretty stressful for anybody. Um, now I think that everyday residents, they're sort of, they, they're, they're, they're sort of an insulation from, from how they feel. And they're like, oh, well, he'll just go out and get another job. It's no big deal. It, it's, not, it's not as personal uh, to them. But, um, you know, it, it's obviously tough, but it's something that I just have to move forward with, you know, with my family. I mean, obviously, I've thought about options and, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm working on those in my head, but I'm still here. Hopefully, I can pay the rent next month. Um, you, you told other media last week, I mean, because... Two weeks ago. Were, I haven't talked to anyone last week, have I? Well, whenever the cockroach night was. Okay. Um, I have a certificate for you, oh, by the wow. way. Good, yeah, good. so I'll, give, I'll, I'll get excellent, it to you soon. Excellent. Um, you wanted that nickname the whole time because Trump was giving everybody nicknames. So remember, you kept saying, Anthony, you have a, do I have a nickname yet? So what am I, Roach Roger? No, you're Roger the Roach. Roger the Roach, yeah. okay. Good. I, I I thought, at first I thought it could be Roger the Rat because you like sniffing around all the time, you know. But I think the Roach is, the Roach because you've been around, you've been around the news media for a long time. You just kind of just don't go away, just like a Roach, just like people say, hey, about Silva. I'm like a Jeanette Stebbins, you know, I just don't go away. Um, so. I think Roger the Roach sounds pretty good. It'll give you good identity when you move on to become the anchor of CNN one day. Oh, so, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sure that that'll probably be the uh, determining factor when I get hired by them. Yes. Um, you've told other media, or you told them that night, that you were interested in working for and have applied to President-elect Trump's office or whatever, you know, transition team. Have you, did you apply to them? Have you heard anything? I've, I've recently uh, made some correspondence to uh, somebody who was um, high up in his campaign mm -hmm. during, the, during the election. But yeah, they're, they're not gonna get to those type of positions for a while. So. What types of positions are you I'm just thinking? looking, I was, just, I was inquiring about, you know, aides, analysts, things like that. Mm -hmm. What do you believe you could bring to them? And what about his message resonates with you? about President Trump's message? Yeah. Well, he's pro-business. I mean, that's uh, a good thing. Um, he's someone that's now, you know, reaching across the aisle to say, hey, let's go to work, let's get some things done. Um, I like that he's willing to listen as much as during the campaign, people said he wasn't um, going to listen. That already when he had that first meeting with President Obama, after they had a discussion, uh, you know, the. President-elect reconsidered his position on Obamacare that maybe he would keep some components of it. I like that. I think that he's doing a good job with some of the folks he's picking in his transition team. So I just think like without anything else, the country is looking for hope right now. And so um, I'm hoping that he can deliver that. Just like for me, whoever is elected president of the United States, they're my president. I stand behind them. And so he's, he's the person that was you know, highly elected in, in every state but this one and Oregon and a couple others. And so we want to give him a chance and get behind him. You mentioned you're not going to have medical insurance on January 1st. Are you hoping he keeps Obamacare at least? Well, I don't know. I have, there's a COBRA coverage op option for like 1300 but even that's kind of expensive. Yeah, that's what, I just came back from the doctor right now before this interview. And so I'm making sure that I, get everything checked for me and my son before it ends. So. Now, a difficult subject here. The arrest and the adverse publicity you were hit with in August. Now, I know legal stuff is still pending with some of this, and I don't know, you know how much you want to talk about that. But do you feel like up until that point, you had a chance to be reelected? Yes. Okay, yeah. so you... 1,000%. Okay. Yeah. Did you feel once that happened? Yeah. Yeah. No chance. Yeah. Before August, there was, I was gonna win and be reelected mayor. You were. Yeah. Okay. What? I mean, you can just look at the numbers and tell. Really, if if uh, Supervisor Villapudua didn't put himself in the race, I would have won in the primary. It would have been over, and I would have won then. Because I was I was close enough, spending absolutely no money in campaigning zilch, and um, 
if he wouldn't have been in the race, I would have, you know, I would have uh, turned on the engines a little bit and then um, finished everybody off right there in the primary. But once he put himself in, I knew it was nobody was going to win in the in the primary. And yeah, because you felt there was no way to get to fifty percent. There wasn't. Plus one. There wasn't. Mm -hmm. But if the kind of numbers that he drew, those those folks were more inclined uh, to to be my supporters at that point. Um, so. And to this day, you feel that what came out in early August was calculated to ruin. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have any any? It was it was timed completely. It was a it was a perfectly timed torpedo. It was well thought out. Multiple people thought about it. Uh, people a year in advance um, at parties here in Stockton, at um, we'll say at wealthy people's homes, talked about this exact subject matter um, up to a year in advance. There was witnesses of it. So the fact that how could they know that sort of stuff a year in advance? And that's more information the public has because the public doesn't even know why all this started. So, and you know, I know you. You know, obviously, you, you and your attorneys have said that you believe the charges against you were politically motivated. Um, and obviously, the big charge against you has already been reduced. It was reduced before the election. That uh, that was. It was too late. Too little. Too late. By that. Yeah. I'm sure, the damage was done. And other people don't understand that. They only understand one thing. They understand that for some reason. Uh, before 9 o'clock a.m. that morning, the news media was out there well in advance. Yourself was among them. If, if law enforcement is so, uh, you know, if they're so honest and they do everything by the book, then how possibly could any news source know about this? Who else do you know is arrested on TV unless it's a reality TV show? I mean, name somebody. Who else do you know gets a... Oh, what do we call it? Uh, a press release about their arrest. Who? Jeffrey Dahmer? Who gets that kind of attention, right? And yet the media was out there well in advance because they were notified and they were tipped off. There's no reason that that circus had to take place other than the fact it was designed for one thing. Which was the derailing. That's right. So do you anticipate any more legal troubles going forward, or do you think that it's just going to all kind of fade away now that now that this is gone? I don't. I don't know. To be honest with you, I don't know. Yeah. What would the reason be for any? I don't know. Yeah. I can't comment because I don't know. No. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen here in January with this stuff. Mm -hmm. I just know that I I didn't accept their whatever they call it, their resolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What they were offering. All right, another touchy subject. Uh, That's your enough. salary was, <laughs> was reduced by thirty percent halfway through your term, and I have heard you say that at least you've considered some sort of legal action mm -hmm. for that. Is that something that is still a possibility, or something that you are exploring at this point? Well. I'm not in the business of suing, you know, my previous employers, um, and you always have a year's time if you're going to do that, um, you know, when you're going to file against a municipality. But my concern is, and I told this to Mayor-elect Tubbs in my office um, a couple weeks ago, in the event that since the charter just got changed and uh, the salary setting commission can meet and present a new uh, package for the city council and the mayor, if the salary is returned uh, to its previous, you know, designation, I would expect obviously they would, you know, they would reach out and say, "Hey, uh, former mayor, we we owe you some compensation." Because really, I don't think anyone in the history of Stockton's ever gotten their salary reduced in the middle of their term um, by a committee like this before. I'm guaranteeing you it never happened. I don't know if it's happened anywhere in the state or the country, for that matter. So um, hopefully they would make good if that does happen. And you know, I and if they don't do it, there's probably nothing I can do, honestly. Uh, but hopefully, if they do raise their salary and put it back, you know, I do think the mayor should be paid a good salary, and you know, it, 
probably should be at least a hundred thousand a year. So. Your vision of downtown that you proposed a year ago, um, is that something that you can continue to advocate for and work for? Um, well, definitely. I, th I definitely can continue to talk to investors and, and help be an ambassador uh, for the city, um, if, you know, if I'm around. And um, I still think that that's, that's the economic engine for Stockton. Every city has something that they're known for. You know, if I said, hey, Roger, you want to go eat at, uh, you know, in downtown Sacramento right now, you'd be like, yeah, let's go to old Sacramento. You know, there's places for us to go that have a distinction in every single city. What does Stockton have? Do they say, hey, we want to go to Stockton and, you know, go to the Miracle Mile? Do we want to go to Stockton and go to Lincoln Center? I don't know if they say that yet in other cities, you know, when they're going to spend some money. So if we, you know, clean up these little areas, these pockets, as I proposed in Stockton Proud, but we spend some money on the waterfront, because we all know that water sells, especially if it's lit up uh, downtown. It's a place where people can walk and shop and, you know, listen to different venues of music. I think that's the future for the city. It's going to take more than a couple years to do it, but I definitely think um, that's a good start. And there's a lot of vacant land, and there's a lot of... Uh, Oh, there's a lot of junky buildings that are still, you know, uh, adjacent to that area that can be cleaned up and nicer buildings can go in. If you had another four years, what would you be? Oh, I, I would, I would that? definitely be pushing that. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Would that be number one in your, uh, on your list? It'll be right up there. I mean, not number one, but it'll be right up there. What would be number one, do you think? Number one would be continuing the public safety, but trying to find some different ways, uh, to deter crime, yeah. A lot of the stuff that you talked yeah, about. Yeah, we talked about. Substations yeah. and, and that sort of yeah. thing. Um, so you, I, I heard you say if you, if you are around. Yeah, because the truth is I don't know what I'm gonna do. But I, I just, you know, I came back from the doctor this afternoon and you know, I have some health concerns that I need to deal with and so I'm gonna spend some, some more time with my son and, and the family members that I never see and catch up with my friends. A lot of my friends I've had for, from kindergarten, and they are not political people, they hate politics. So they don't like to read all the mumbo jumbo in the papers and, and, and watch the, you know, the crazy stuff on TV. So they, to them, they just feel like, hey, we're getting, we're getting our friend back. And so I gotta spend some time with them as well. So. Is the health stuff serious or all right? You know, it's gotta take care of it. You know, stuff you gotta take care of. Um, do you, you know, I, I want to go back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago, and, you know, I've just got a few more questions, but you... I've always been transparent. I've always, for the most part, until we get into these little... I, I just, what I want to ask you is, you mentioned, you know, that if you had a PIO when you were in office, that you could have worked with the paper, yes. and maybe yeah. there would have been some... But do you understand why the news media is independent of that, why the news media doesn't work for any person who's an elected official. I mean, do you, do you recognize... Yeah, it's not a communist country. You guys don't want to be controlled. You want to have the, the freedom of speech and the freedom of press. But with that comes a fine line between reporting the news and then creating the news. And I really believe the record is that it feels that they're the, uh, they're the big fish in the small pond and all the little Stockton Post and the Hispanic Chamber papers and the Chamber of Commerce papers and the, uh, oh, what's the other newspaper that's out there? I don't know. There's some magazines that show up. They just feel like all those papers are, are really ancillary in nature. They're, they're kind of a joke. And so as a result, you guys can pretty much say what you want. And when you do that, there's a danger. What happens if you say the wrong thing? is the next day there's a retraction on the front page of the paper that says, hey, we were wrong. We thought we were right because of A, B, and C, but now we heard of D, E, and F, and it turns out we weren't so right. You guys will never do that. You guys will print a two-sentence retraction on the back of page you know, 16, when there is 16 pages, but for the most part, um, you guys don't do that. And so there's a lot of people that I've come in contact with that just feel over the years you guys have either run people out of town or you guys have tarnished their reputation so bad 
that they couldn't recover. There's a lot of people that feel like that. And I know that for you, you're just a reporter, you're thinking, oh, I'm just doing my job, I'm reporting a story, I'm not trying to ruin anyone's life or career. But I think there's a danger if you guys subconsciously at least don't think about that. Michael Fitzgerald knows this, but he doesn't care because that's why he feels that like he gets paid for his opinion. And when he writes a story, by the way, it should not be in the news section because it's not news. He's not reporting something that just happened. It's an opinion. It should be on the opinion page. That's just, that's just my opinion. And I, you know what? I get opinion because I've been hit harder, or I'm sure they'll pull someone out who was hit harder in 1950 by the record. But I've been hit harder by anybody else in the history of this city. Now they can say, well, deservingly so. The mayor's a bad guy and blah, 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 blah. Okay, but it's all, a, it's all perception. Okay, it's, it's all perception. We're getting back to the if you're going to be around. Yeah. I do have to harken back to yeah. six or eight months ago where you told me if I lose, I'm moving to the Philippines. Yeah, that's always a, that's always a, that's always a possibility. Why the Philippines? I enjoyed myself in the Philippines. I enjoyed myself in a lot of the different countries that I went to. So there's always an option really? to go there. Interesting. Um, is one of your options ever to run for an elective office again, or do you think At this time, no. Yeah. But you wouldn't rule it out for now. I, I've had enough for now. For now. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And you know, but when you guys go for like two years, in two to four years, and you guys get really bored of the same old stories, you know, hopefully your editorial board comes back and say, you know what, Anthony, this is not the same without you. Come back so we can build up our readership again. Maybe I'll think about it, you know. Well, I do have to say <laughs> that we have our, our little monitor in the office that shows us who's reading what and how many stories are being read by the readers. And often, yours my, were... Uh, my stories lead a league? Yeah, you were the league leader. Oh, wow. Yeah. What will you guys do without me? <laughs> um, any other... Uh, any other thoughts about in an ideal world what you would do next? Just basically make enough to pay my rent, feed my kid. That's about it. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you. You're a good sport for uh, yeah. I think it was a good interview for doing this, taking this time, and uh, I would like my roach certificate now. I will. I'm gonna get it. <laughs>